Hi, welcome to another edition of Ordinary Differential Equations. Today we are going to talk about uh, free damped vibrations. Let's go ahead and take a look at the mathematical setup. <coughs> so, here are two adjectives for vibrations. Free vibration uh, simply means we don't have an external variable force, just as last time. Now, we are going to take a look at damped free vibration. What does that mean? That means that we have damping or drag force in our problem. The one I did in the previous lecture was an undamped free vibration. It meant that there was no drag force involved. So the equations for those uh, situation was mass times acceleration plus spring constant times displacement equal to zero. When we wrote the characteristic equation and solved it, we came across this very important number. Uh, this is the frequency of undamped vibrations. Omega zero is square root of k over m. And the solution was sine and cosine of this frequency times time. Now we are going to add a, a realistic complication to our problem. That we are going to have damping in our problems. We are going to have a drag force involved. So we have an additional term which is Cy prime. That's the damping coefficient. That's the velocity. So that's going to be our differential equation. We have seen many uh, forms of this differential equation before so we have a mathematical foundation for this thing already set up so we can quickly go ahead and solve this thing. So we said we write the characteristic equation of it and then we solve this. So it's a quadratic equation we solve it and we have two roots or characteristic roots. Depending on what you have under this radical one of three cases is going to happen. If you remember, we had this discussion before. It was just M, B, uh, instead of M, you had an A, here was a B, and here was a C, but just the same thing. <coughs> In our problem, M, C, K are positive numbers. So we are going to have three cases depending on what happens inside the radical. That entity inside the radical is called discriminant, uh, so it's typically shown by delta in algebra books. So let's delta be the stuff in the radical. One of three things is going to happen. Either this delta is positive, in which case, well, we have two roots here. Both of them are going to be negative and different from each other. Here how you can write the two roots, one with positive, one with negative in front of the radical and your solution is going to be y is equal to exponential of one times time plus exponential of the other one times time. <coughs> this case is referred to as overdamped situation because when you say this is positive means c squared is more than 4mk. This was the drag coefficient uh, so the drag coefficient is more than a certain amount so it means in some sense we have a lot of uh, damping damping wins against the mass and uh, spring constant. Case 2. More interesting than case 1 is case 2 when the number inside the radical is negative. So your solutions are going to be complex numbers. Uh, typically in high school you said put this thing aside, call them imaginary and so on, but uh, this actually happens to be more real than the real case. So in this case we have delta less than 0 and then we have two complex conjugate roots when you have add uh, your add and subtract the imaginary component the two numbers you get you call them conjugate so let's write it uh, uh, so that we can see the real imaginary imaginary part if i take is minus c divided by 2 and put it separately and here i factor a minus one out of it take square root of that which is the i and when I factor minus 1 out of it, it becomes 4mk minus c squared. 
so inside my radical but now is 4 mk minus c squared now inside radical is positive the negative factor has been pulled out as the imaginary unit i still remember that there is a denominator of 2m so this number has to be divided by 2m this situation is going to be referred to as underdamped underdamped means c squared is less than 4mk that's why it became negative uh, why this terminology why you call it under because now the damping coefficient is a less than a certain amount so we have little damping if it was a lot of damping is like this a little damping is like that this quantity, the imaginary part of this uh, number, is called a pseudo frequency. Sometimes it's called, let me, uh, uh, sometimes your textbook, depending what textbook you use, uh, might be called quasi frequency. So you can uh, nickname it uh, omega sub p or perhaps omega sub q, whatever your style is. So pseudo or quasi means sort of like frequency. It's a strange terminology, but in this case, we had a frequency of the undamped vibration. Let me emphasize that the frequency of undamped vibration. which was simply square root of k over m and you solve that equation is very simple here is a bit more involved it becomes 4 mk minus c squared over 2m if you take the 2m inside again you get the k over m but uh, you get minus c squared over 4m squared as a correction so that's called uh, uh, quasi frequency and we are going to see that the solution looks like this as we have seen before exponential of this real part times time times uh, sine and cosine of the imaginary uh, part which is now quasi frequency times time between these two cases there's a so-called uh, critical case it's critical simply means in between here not that anything uh, you know, dangerous is happening or anything uh, critical simply mathematically means in between two case so if you have a delta equal to zero you are going to get that uh, peculiar situation of two identical roots previously we call this root of multiplicity two or a pair or a double root and such so if uh, the radical is zero all that is left is going to be minus c over 2m r1 and r2 both are, are just that that root in that case you remember that we write the solution as exponential of this number times time times a polynomial uh, this boils down to a polynomial becomes a t plus b okay so uh, due to the fact that we had solved these things this type of equations before we were able to quickly list uh, these three cases if uh, you don't remember the details of this you want to go back to the beginning of uh, chapter 3 and uh, take a look at the examples that we had done there before now what we are going to do take an example of a problem where it has damping in it and then solve it and see what is involved in the steps of the solution so here is uh, problem 9 from uh, uh, section 37 and uh, uh, almost fills a page to this, uh, to write it down but very easy so let's see what does the problem say so a mass of 20 gram stretches a spring by 5 centimeters then the mass is attached to a viscous damper with the damping coefficient of 400 the unit now is dyne times second per centimeter if the mass is pulled down an additional two centimeter and then released find its position u at any time t then several requirements plot u versus t determine the quasi frequency and quasi period determine the ratio of the quasi period to the period of corresponding undamped motion and finally find the first time tau this is Greek letter tau such that u of t stays less than 0.05 centimeters 
for all time larger than tau. Okay, so uh, we said the problems of this section are all in the style of word problems. There are application problems where uh, an experimental setup is explained in words, and then we want to figure out what that experiment is going to show mathematically. By itself, that's a miracle that you can sit down on a piece of paper, predict what's going to happen in a laboratory. <coughs> okay, we said these problems have uh, three sections of three phases to them. One is to translate from science to mathematics. Second phase, uh, do the mathematical problem that arises. And then third phase is to translate the results back to that scientific uh, topic. So step one, uh, which is called modeling, we want to convert our problem to statement of this. We said we have a differential equation and there are uh, initial conditions of it. We want to write down ODE and initial conditions, solve it according as to which one of these three cases is going to be and then uh, come back and answer a bunch of questions like these type of questions would not have been there in the mathematical side perhaps but now they make sense in the engineering side all statements about the frequency uh, relationship between damped and undamped uh, the time at which you can say the oscillations have died down <coughs> so what was the trick we said uh, every a little piece of the problem gives you one clue and then uh, you use all of these clues to set up your problem clue number one so uh, let me see if you can pause this thing and you actually set up the uh, problem yourself that is you go ahead and found all these uh, key numbers the key numbers were M, C, K, Y0, Y prime 0, and uh, that would be the setup for your mathematical problem. So let me see if you can go ahead. It's uh, easy. We have done it once before. So pause this thing and set that thing yourself. Okay, clue number one is pretty easy. Straight out, it tells you what the mass is. So uh, our mass is. 20 and now the units are in the so-called cgs system cgs means centimeter gram and second so this is gram so 20 grams of course you can always convert to any unit you want but sometimes you can get away uh, from that by just not doing any conversion and stay keep the numbers as they are and that is preferred Okay, what does this mass do? It stretches a spring by uh, 5 centimeter. So that would be clue number 2. Uh, where do we use this clue? Wh what does that tell us? What aspect of the problem is uh, revealed by this uh, data? We had the exact same thing at the beginning of the previous problem. So, uh, if you didn't pause, let me uh, encourage you again one more time to pause this thing and think about this thing. What does this uh, reveal about our problem? Remember, we had that uh, f f force of spring is equal to uh, minus k and then the displacement. Well, when you attach a mass to a spring, what kind of a force does it put on the spring? Well, the force that it puts is the force of gravity, which you simply call weight. Force of gravity is just m uh, g. Let me write this unit in complete so that uh, it doesn't get uh, confused with this g. So let me also here avoid the. Uh, confusion that 20 grams uh, in your textbook it uses different font for this thing so perhaps you wouldn't get uh, confused but here let's be careful so w what is the weight of 20 grams to find the weight you have to multiply by the constant of acceleration what's the constant of acceleration 
uh, constant of acceleration in the CGS system, we said that's 980. Sometimes they say just 1000. So the force that is on this spring is mass 20 times uh, gravitational constant 980 and it causes a displacement of 5 centimeters. So my force is 20 that's m times g 980 now we are taking absolute values of the quantities involved so that minus 1 evaporates k is a quantity we are trying to find here and the y is the displacement 5 so from this we find out that k is equal to say 20 times 980 over 5 and well we can simplify this thing and 20 over 5 is uh, 4 did I make a mistake here <coughs> Okay, now uh, uh, we go on to, so we have one uh, uh, other piece of the puzzle. So, so far we have, what do we have? We have our M, we have our K. Uh, let's see, how about C? Do we have C? Well, in, uh, sorry. Uh, this problem, it just uh, straight out tells us what C is going to be. So, RC is... 400. Now we say that the mass is pulled down an additional 2 centimeters. Do you remember what part of our modeling this one reveals? Additional 2 centimeters. What is that? That was, of course, our initial uh, condition. Initial displacement is 2. This is 2 from the equilibrium position. After it came down 5 cm, it, it comes down an additional 2 cm. We said we measure uh, distances after the first displacement. That automatically takes care of the gravitation and we don't need to worry about it. What does this phrase reveal? The, the mass is then released what aspect of the problem comes out of that so when you release something the initial speed is zero okay we have our problem all set up i have mck and have y0 y prime zero so i can write it then i can uh, go ahead and solve it to know what the solution that i get is going to be called position that was the meaning of the problem, but meaning of y or u or whatever you want to refer to it. Then it says, well, graph this thing to see what happens. So for that, we are going to go to Desmos. And then uh, some uh, physical quantities are required here in some discussion. Let's go ahead, uh, set up the problem, solve the problem up to this stage, and then we we'll talk about the rest of these things. So. Uh, Again, I wrote uh, my lettering with Y, and the, most of the problems in the text uh, uses the letter U, I guess just to be neutral compared to X and Y and a Z, whatever you want to call it, the book says, okay, I'm going to use U, but anyway, so let's uh, write down the solution here, and then we uh, write the answers in front of these questions later on. So I have uh, we said we have m u double prime plus c u prime plus k u equal to zero u zero and u prime zero are given quantities. That's our differential equation and that's our initial condition. Together they form a so-called initial value problem. 
initial value problem is when you have initial quantities given as opposed to something else called boundary value problem and you see on the cover of your text that that is also included in your book okay our m turned out to be uh, it was just given it was 20 uh, so 20 u double prime c was just given uh, nicely so that was 400 k we had to work for that k we got 39 20 u0 was the movement in the second phase of the problem of two centimeters u prime zero said so the object is being released okay we are done with the first phase of our problem we have converted from laboratory statement to a mathematical equation now we go ahead and solve this thing for a while these quantities don't need to mean anything they're just numbers uh, we go through mathematical uh, steps and interesting thing is that at the tip of our pencil we can predict how nature is going to go so that's one of the uh, marvels of this <coughs> You can calculate nature so uh, we go ahead and clean this up as much as we can uh, we can see all numbers can di be divided by 20 making numbers small is uh, better for us because we are going to make less mistakes that way so I go ahead and divide uh, dividing this by 20 uh, zeros cancel and I get 196 you <coughs> so we learn to be quick here we write the quadratic uh, characteristic equation solving this also straightforward minus 20 plus or minus 20 squared minus four times first and last numbers maybe I go ahead and write this thing also uh, unprocessed so that we see what what is involved here 20 squared divided by 2 times 1 <coughs> so that becomes minus 20 plus or minus that is now let's write 400 4 times 196 uh, so that I'm gonna have okay that's four short of 200 so that's going to be 16 short of uh, 800 and then so r becomes minus 20 plus or minus square root of minus 384 before we divide we simplify so minus 20 plus or minus uh, 380 uh, Sec, uh, 384 I can <coughs> uh, 384 keep dividing it by 2 I guess it goes as far as 64 times 6 <coughs> so I broke it like that because 364 uh, <coughs> let's write it one more time So I write this in minus 20 plus or minus. I take a 64 out. 6 stays. And minus becomes i. So now I divide by 2. <coughs> so it becomes minus 10 plus or minus 4 radical 6. <coughs> Sorry. So what does that mean? It means my uh, function u is going to be exponential. Then I have the real part minus 10 t. 
then this no minus side no <coughs> I that's going to be our quasi frequency so cosine of 4 radical 6 T and then B sine of same thing when you're entering this formula on Desmos or any other calculator two mistake has to be avoided one is a uh, very common mistake of leaving T inside this radical that's a typo during entering of the formula you have to <coughs> kind of step forward to make sure your T is outside but you don't want to go too far out that is this T is not outside of this parentheses it's the argument of sine or cosine so either of those two kind of mistakes is going to throw the problem completely off and you want to avoid it okay then what uh, well this is the general solution to impose the initial condition we need to have the derivative and the function calculated at zero so I have my function I need to calculate the derivative of this a little bit lengthy because of the product rule but if you are careful it can be done very quickly so let me uh, write it starting from here u prime at time t uh, when I differentiate this one, it's a factor of minus 10 comes out. Uh, now, if you are uh, want to be economical, you're just copying all of that. So you can write minus 10 u if you feel comfortable doing that. That's uh, much nicer. So uh, minus 10 t times uh, a cosine of uh, 4 radical 6 t so when you become mathematically mature you uh, find abbreviations so that you don't write as much but right now let me just write all the steps so we don't confuse anybody uh, second step up product rule you have to differentiate these things and each of them by product uh, by chain rule is going to give this factor out and cosine becomes minus sine sine becomes minus cosine so to keep it clean I take this factor out and write it outside so I am going to write plus 4 radical 6 I still have an exponential then this cosine became minus sine and the co sine became cosine now you want to write it however you are comfortable with and compare your answer with mine make sure that we are on the same page okay so this is my function and its derivative the only reason we needed to do this thing is that uh, we need the initial condition so let's go ahead at time zero time zero remember exponential becomes one cosine becomes one and sine becomes zero so out of this lengthy expression the only thing that survives is just a so if you want to have a shortcut well I hate to teach uh, students dirty tricks but here's your shortcut what happens u0 is a u prime 0 is minus 10 a and then becomes 4 radical 6 b So u0 is always a. u prime 0 is the of these two components of the root that you have. Minus 10 is what you see is minus 10a. And then uh, the positive 4 radical 6, the uh, <coughs> pseudo frequency times b. So uh, this step can be abbreviated by saying that in always uh, turns out like that. And then you go ahead and find your a and b so what are we given we are given that at time zero we are starting two centimeters down so u zero that means this is two and our initial speed is zero so this is zero so of course first one just tells you a is straight out is just two second equation uh, you can solve it to get the b if you wish you can actually even make formulas like that a is equal to u0 and uh, so if you want to turn this thing around 
the A quantity is just U0 in, in all cases. B quantity, what is that? That's going to be U prime 0 plus 10A. So let me write it like this. This is U prime 0. That's going to be minus minus 10 a which is u0 divided by 4 radical 6 which is our pseudo frequency or quasi frequency okay so if you want to <coughs> have a formula but let's go ahead and do it uh, the traditional way. I just have a is equal to 0. I put the a here. So I have minus 20 plus 4 radical 6b equal to 0. And so b becomes 20 over 4 radical 6. <coughs> you can simplify this thing if you wish. Uh, so like for example 5 over radical 6. Uh, so in the formula that I wrote here, I need another lettering for my, uh, uh, instead of 10, what did we put here? So uh, minus C over 2M really. So that uh, 10 here If you want to make a formula, you have to make it uh, general for your all of your problems. Okay, uh, so I have my A and B. So U at time T is going to be the exponential. Of what we had was minus 10 T times A, which was uh, 2. and then 4 radical 6 t and then b turned out to be 5 over radical 6 if you want to rationalize be my guess uh, either way is fine sine of 4 radical 6 t okay what do we have we have uh, find the position u at any time t that's what we achieved after all this work i have the position so let's go ahead well this box is not uh, a bit too So what is this? This is the position. It asks for a graph of this. Uh, well, let's go ahead and let me write it down so that I don't need to flip flop this page too many times on you. Uh, so what we have here is uh, exponential of minus 10 t times 2 cosine of 4 radical 6 plus 5 over radical 6 sine of same so let's go to our very useful desmos uh, you're calling it u so let's go u uh, let's see if Sometimes Desmos prefers X and Y's and such. If necessary, we modify like that. Exponential of uh, minus T. So to go to the exponent, it is, of course, uh, uh, shift 6. Oh, and I forgot already. This is 10 T. Then uh, I have 2 cosine of 
now we open in parentheses we put all the stuff inside so four how do i uh, do square root one way is to type in sqrt uh, well, uh, radical six now the mistake not to make is to put the t here that's not what is meant in this formula t is not inside the parentheses arrow to right then t comes outside might not notice it at the beginning what's a big difference but there is a big difference plus uh, 5 uh, over so slash skew rt of 6 again uh, we step forward to come out of this uh, fraction sign of uh, parentheses open for uh, skew rt 6 arrow forward T close this parentheses and there is a still another parentheses so uh, let me uh, zoom out a bit the section of these graphs for the negative time T are irrelevant to us because the experiment that starts at time 0 and goes forward so um, as is typical negative side is not necessary we just clip it off uh, if you want to go all the way there be my guest so if you want to clip it off we see that the solution comes down and then it seems to be dying uh, and flattening out quickly due to the fact that we have this uh, factor of minus 10 in the exponent the solution it dies away very quickly so it's uh, damping means it's high uh, and that's why we don't see the details here it has died out very quickly if you actually want to see you have to keep zooming this thing to see what's happening so if you're zooming uh, now due to the fact that this is dying really fast even if we keep zooming we still uh, let me zoom one more time y you see previously it was looking all flat but now it appears that there is some intersection here and then uh, the graph comes up reaches a certain kind of a maximum if you wish and then if we follow this thing at some point it comes below the vertical axis becomes negative and oscillates so if you want to see this kind of uh, excuse me the other way if you want to see a very fine detail you have to keep uh, zooming uh, and zooming if you see that it's just getting to be too tiring to keep zooming you can change the graph settings for example uh, what we have trouble with is on the vertical axis on the vertical axis if you want to zoom quite a bit so let me go ahead and zoom by factor of 10 I put a 10 here uh, an extra 0 here an extra 0 here that means I zoomed my y axis by a factor of 10 and as soon as I zoom I see the the feature that it came down became negative and so on if you want to zoom it more put another factor of zero bit, uh, before your number okay by now we zoomed uh, maybe by a thousand or something and the graph that previously was looking so flat now it doesn't look all that flat anymore well what is happening to our axis and that u or y axis here this is one ten thousandth two ten thousandths and so on so we have zoomed by quite a bit maybe by 10,000 by now and that's uh, what helps us to see in the <coughs> while I'm on this page I might as well do the other problem too it's asking when does this does oscillation die below 0.05 so in an engineering problem when you're dealing with an oscillation uh, well you don't want to wait until eternity to say this oscillation has died down you want to cut it off at some place and say okay uh, let's go do something else so there's always a concept of a threshold time at the threshold time 
uh, the quantity of consideration has fallen below a certain value and uh, in some sense you're declaring the patient dead or something so uh, in this case uh, the values uh, were uh, what were they I think 0.05 I, um, let me go make sure what did we have here yes 0.05 centimeter so that's very tiny oscillation compared to the fact that at the beginning we are starting at 2 centimeters so we are going all the way down to 0.05 and saying okay that is uh, enough so uh, we go ahead and write 0.05 uh, we don't see it anywhere here because we have zoomed out so much that this number looks big <coughs> let's go ahead and uh, because we need this thing in absolute value we want to uh, surround it from top and bottom to to see this thing we have to go back to the original or zoom out or something so that uh, 0 0.05 and point uh, minus 0 0.05 are going to be visible so first we go back to uh, our original graph uh, no still 0 0.05 compared to 2 is going to be too small and we are not going to see these uh, two uh, lines so let me write u of t I, I needed to have a t there now everything's kind of uh, pushed against each other so again I need to zoom uh, so at least now I see the two lines let's zoom one more time okay in this case this is enough we see that we start at 2 the oscillation dies down quite quickly goes through the first green line the green line is 0.05 goes inside this trap if you wish to call it a trap but then it gets out so at this point it is uh, in absolute value more than 0.05 then it comes and dies again crosses the blue line this is the or the purple line uh, crosses minus 0.05 and comes inside and then after that it always stays inside this trap so the, the last moment that it enters is going to be the point of interest for us that's what the tau is so if we go click this thing uh, we see point of, uh, point 0.405 that's our tau and after that time we have entered uh, inside this strip and we are always inside that strip if you want to see it more clearly let me uh, zoom in a few more time okay so that uh, if you want to be more careful you can uh, click here now <coughs> when you zoom in uh, Desmos gives you more digits uh, on a homework system typically they ask for four digits and the, sometimes you can get this thing by just zooming in more and more and then there is another way of doing it uh, a bit more automatically I have a description of that on my website you can check that or there are other software uh, most notably uh, so-called GeoGebra that copies Desmos and has the same feature and it gives you a lot more digits on the very first go so here we have our uh, uh, tau time after which the oscillation has died pretty much so we go back to our um, so the answer to this one I have this uh, calculated early I don't need to wait until the end of the problem uh, so this is how, how they write it uh, and uh, it turned out to be something like this okay uh, we are almost all done so we have uh, position we have the f we have the formula we have the plot of it quasi frequency quasi frequency we said uh, that is argument of sine and cosine uh, 
at the multiple of t that's the quasi frequency why do they qu call it quasi well because it's not really just a plane sine and cosine it's dying off so it has uh, some features of a trigonometric function but not quite and for that reason they call it pseudo or quasi uh, the look alike and so on so our quasi frequency omega let's call q or omega p or just omega or so these are all uh, notations uh, various books could use uh, for us it was four radical six okay <coughs> quasi period uh, quasi period is well how many of these things fit in uh, there's always 2 pi over omega so 2 pi over 4 radical 6 you might just leave it like that and typically uh, if your homework system doesn't ask for so many decimal digits and so on it wants the exact answer if it told you to five decimal places then you crank out your calculator and converted this to decimal otherwise you don't determine the ratio of quasi period that is this to the period of the corresponding undamped motion what does that mean corresponding undamped motion means if by some magic we could go to this setup and remove all the source of damping somehow make it undamped no uh, drag force at all it would be a comparable problem that problem would have its own frequency and its own period the question is what's the ratio of these two to each other very standard concept in engineering problems and uh, what it means is that when you are taking a look at this problem and solving you go ahead rather artificially you just remove the damping term so the problem becomes that and the frequency of that one is just radical k over m and uh, remember that uh, period of that period always 2 pi over omega 0 so uh, it's going to be 2 pi over square root of k over m so um, excuse me undamped uh, so the period of undamped is going to be 2 pi over square root of k over m or k was 3920 uh, m was 20 the ratio of these two we had calculated before that was uh, that was uh, that's just 196 over there and uh, that would be the period of undamped motion well we got lucky or perhaps this was designed that this just comes out to be 14 now it's asking for the ratio the ratio of this one to that one so I have a ratio of 2 pi let me change my coloring so that it's getting crowded here 2 pi so that's the period of the real system this is the corresponding idealistic thing without any kind of drag in it so that's 2 pi over 14 you know how to divide a fraction by another fraction so uh, you flip this and multiply of course it's going to become 14 over 4 radical 6 which if you want you can uh, simplify you can leave it alone uh, by now that issue is a simple issue for you okay <coughs> uh, so uh, 
let's go back and see what happened. Quick review of this, and then we come uh, to conclusion. So we looked at uh, damped free oscillations, no external force, but we do have a damping. Previous lecture was undamped oscillation. There was no Y prime pair. There was no C there. With the presence of damping, we have a full quadratic equation. We have to solve it. We have always these radicals and such. There are three possibilities. Uh, the case that is actually interesting is for the complex roots. That's where you see the oscillations. In the other cases, you don't see anything resembling oscillation. When we have that, we have two components to our characteristic equation, a real part and an imaginary part. This is how the solution dies out. This is how the solution oscillates. So this portion is referred to as a pseudo frequency or a quasi frequency or some terminology like that. The solution uh, has two components. This is the dying component. That's a oscillatory component. In between these two, we have critically damped which is of uh, theoretical interest, just drawing a line in the sand between the two cases. We solve one of these problems again. We had three stages converting our verbal description to uh, elements are of our mathematical description. So we extract these numbers, we solve the equation, and then we come back and label a variety of things for uh, for the solution that we have in mind. And presumably, we should be able to detect all of these things in a laboratory and uh, confirm our findings. OK, uh, we are more uh, in more mature parts of the course. These uh, problems are more extensive than before. Uh, and uh, of course, you should expect that they, they take a little bit more time. Uh, do spend time with the problems of this class, uh, with the textbook, reproduce uh, problems in the textbook, uh, do as many of these problems as uh, completely as possible, look at it from different points of view, mathematical, uh, from Desmos, going back and forth until everything makes sense to you. Okay, uh, it was a bit of a lengthy lecture. Until next time, uh, good luck and God bless.